quickly go ahead and begin. All right. Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to Citywide Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Arno Kumiga. I'm the Vice Chair for Education for the Department of Medicine, um, and we'll be shortly introducing uh, Dr. Paula Harvey, our Physician Chief at Women's College Hospital, uh, for the explanation of these special Grand Rounds in the introduction of the speaker. Um, I would like to start out as we are doing uh, by tradition in the Department of Medicine with a land acknowledgement. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the land on which we work, study, and live. We recognize many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the land upon which the work of the University of Toronto's Department of Medicine is conducted. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional unceded territory of many indigenous nations including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Ashinabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, this, home is, uh, this land is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Meti peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and gather on these territories. Um, it's important to note that land acknowledgements are only a starting point for a larger conversation. More concrete acts of restitution and transformation are needed to address underlying inequities and blatant discrimination and racism in the distribution of resources between Canada's First Peoples and their settlers. On that note, I would like to turn the uh, conversation over to Paula Harvey, the Physician-in-Chief of Women's College Hospital. Paula, please. Thanks, Arno. This year, as in the past, we've asked the uh, FM Hill annual invited lecturer to give this citywide medical grand rounds. The FM Hill Lectureship is held annually to honour an exceptional physician, mentor and teacher and former physician-in-chief at Women's College Hospital, Dr Peggy Hill. She was at Women's College Hospital for 27 years and when she retired, her colleagues and friends and patients established an endowment in her name. This endowment has grown over the years and it now um, actually supports three endowed chairs, the FM Hill Chairs in Academic Women's Medicine, in health system solutions and in humanism education. Plus this annual lectureship in medicine. And we also have two resident awards that uh, are supported by this endowment. One for mentoring, and this year this went to Dr. Shaliza Halani, who was our chief medical resident last year. And also we had two for hum humanitarianism. And these two awards this year went to Drs. Abdulrahman Azeb and Dr. George George Okobolos. So this year we've invited Dr. Lorraine Lipscomb to be our lecturer. And it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Lipscomb. Dr. Lipscomb is a University of Toronto professor and she's a clinician scientist in the Department of Medicine and the Women's College Research Institute. She's in the Division of Endocrinology at Women's College Hospital and U of T. Dr. Lipscomb received her MD from McGill University followed by training in internal medicine and endocrinology and a master's in clinical epidemiology at U of T. Dr. Lipscomb leads a successful internationally recognized research program in diabetes, epidemiology and health services with a particular focus of the burden of diabetes in women. She's published over 150 peer reviewed articles and led many research grants. She's also held numerous awards, including a Diabetes Investigator Award from Diabetes Canada, where she currently serves on the Board of Directors. Now, most recently, Dr. Lipscomb was appointed as the inaugural director for the University of Toronto's Novo Nordisk Network for Healthy Populations. And this is a cross-disciplinary research network based at the University of Tor Toronto Mississauga campus. This network is unique and it unite, unites academics with community stakeholders in Mississauga to address the burden of diabetes and other chronic diseases through community-based research. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Lipscomb, who's going to give us um, a lecture today titled Sugar and Spice, Issues and Challenges for Diabetes in Women. Thank you, Dr. Lipscomb. Thank you so much, uh, Paula, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Lorraine, you're on mute. OK, sorry, I'll start over. <laughs> thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes? 
Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Paula, and thank you everyone for joining today um, and uh, taking time out of your busy day to listen to my uh, talk, uh, outlining some of the research that I've done over the last few years around uh, diabetes in women. So um, I'd like to start with my disclosures. Uh, I received salary support, as Paula mentioned, as the director of the Novo Nordisk Network for Healthy Populations at the University of Toronto. Uh, the network was created thanks to a donation to the University of Toronto from Novo Novo Nordisk Foundation, but I have no direct relationships with Novo Nordisk, and um, this talk has no relation to products from Novo Nordisk. Um, I would like to start by thanking my colleagues at Women's College and University of Toronto for inviting me and selecting me to give the prestigious FM Hill Lecture this year. I am so honored to join past FM Hill lecturers for the opportunity to celebrate the legacy of Peggy Hill, who is a true trailblazer for women in academic medicine, and we're so proud that she was not only at a University of Toronto, but at Women's College Hospital. And as a clinician scientist at Women's College Hospital since my appointment in 2006, I have benefited greatly for the generous support and the legacy left by uh, Dr. Hill. And I can tell you that even though doors have been opened for us, thanks to people like Peggy Hill, who paved the way for academic physicians, and we have come a long way since those days, there are still challenges as a woman in academic medicine. I, like many women and some men, uh, suffer from the so-called imposter syndrome, where I sometimes don't see myself or often don't see myself as worthy of my stature and role. And especially early on in my career, I was often afraid to speak up, didn't think I had something to say. And when I did, I felt that people didn't always listen or take me seriously. Now, I'm still learning and I have come a long way myself, but I and I've overcome a lot of these barriers. But that is thanks to the amazing mentors and role models that I've had throughout my education and career. From my undergraduate honors thesis supervisor, Dr. Barbara Woodside, who convinced me to pursue medicine when I didn't even see myself in that career, um, to my wonderful master's thesis supervisor, Dr. Jan Hux, who regularly found opportunities for me to break out of my shell, put myself out there, and she truly saw potential in me when I didn't see it in myself. But at Women's College was where I really understood the value of mentorship from female academic leaders. We have a wealth of wonderful role models at Women's College that have really honored and um, continued the legacy of Dr. Hill, from Jillian Hawker, uh, Dr. Kathy Kelly, Paula Rochon, and of course, Dr. Paula Harvey, trailblazers in their own right, who created a climate uh, for me and others to promote and celebrate academic medicine pursued the female way, with a keen understanding of our unique challenges, as well as our attributes as women. Um, and I'd like to say a special thank you to my mentors. Uh, first of all, Dr. Jan Hux, who really saw the potential and believed in me and really helped launch uh, my career and, um, and the work that you're going to see today. Dr. Jillian Hawker, who was my previous physician in chief, who always encouraged me to be ambitious and pursue questions that I thought were important, and then find the methods and resources to answer them. And more recently, thank you, Jillian, for encouraging me to take on a new leadership role when I didn't see myself in it. Dr. Kathy Kelly, who always pushed me to speak up, be part of the solution, and trust my instincts. And Dr. Paula Rochon, who actually made it acceptable and permissive for women to sometimes take a slower path to success, especially as young mothers like myself, and that it was okay to prioritize family. Um, and of course, my current physician in chief, Dr. Paula Harvey, for her undying support and advocacy, and for really focusing on the important, importance of wellness, which is really, really a, a big deal, especially now in the last couple of years. And finally, a special thank you to all the students and trainees and fellows that I've had the privilege and honor to supervise over the years. They continually inspire and invigorate me and have allowed me to multiply the impact of work that we do. And um, I, it, nothing uh, gives me more satisfaction than to see um, their careers launched um, and if I had a small part in um, helping make that happen. So I'm going to move on to uh, my talk um, and tell you a little bit about some of the research that I've done um, related to diabetes in women. Um, I'm going to start by briefly just describing the epidemiology of diabetes in women, demonstrate the unique aspects of how diabetes affects women across the lifespan, and then illustrate windows of opportunity to reduce diabetes-related risks. 
I'm going to start with a case. Now, this is a fictitious case, but I have put it together based on a number of patients that I've seen over the years in my clinical practice. So meet Diane. Diane is a 62-year-old woman who has type 2 diabetes. She manages her diabetes with um, medications as well as insulin injections and has to check her sugar several times a day to keep it under control. She also has high blood pressure and high cholesterol, like many of our patients, and has to take medications to manage that. She's told that she needs to eat a healthy diet to get regular physical activity and to get at least eight hours of sleep. But she does find it challenging to follow all these recommendations. First, she comes from a culture where she is expected to create to um, make traditional meals for her family, and those meals aren't always compatible with the uh, advice that she's given. Now, she's told to walk and do exercise, but she has knee pain, probably from osteoarthritis that is not really well managed, and that really limits her ability to, to walk. But even if she wanted to walk, she lives in a neighborhood that is highly unwalkable, she, um, with few sidewalks and few places to go. Now, she also works full time, and because she lives in a more sort of uh, outside area, outside of where she works, she has to commute upwards of one hour each way a day just to get to work. Um, sorry, one hour each way just to get to work. And so that leaves her little time to exercise, to cook healthy meals, and often it disrupts her sleep. So in addition to managing her um, medical conditions and working full time, she also uh, has uh, two grown children, one who lives uh, with her at home, and she is the main caregiver for her ailing mother, re which requires her attention. So it's no surprise that Diane often feels overwhelmed and finds it really challenging to manage her diabetes in the context of all of these other life stressors. So one day, uh, Diane is... Um, uh, taking a shower, and she notes uh, a breast lump. And then she starts to think, oh my goodness, when's the last time I had my mammogram? And she realizes that she's gone way beyond the recommended three-year interval uh, for having uh, mammograms for postmenopausal women. And so she goes, she has a mammogram, and sure enough, a lump is found, uh, sorry, a lesion is found, and she gets a biopsy. She has stage two breast cancer. She has to undergo surgery, chemotherapy. Thankfully, she recovers from this, but but this has really uh, thrown her for a loop and has caused her to start reflecting on, um, you know, what could have uh, what could have happened. And so um, she starts thinking, was this because of my diabetes? Could I have done anything to prevent this? Um, and then she starts thinking even, could I have done anything to prevent diabetes from happening in the first place? And she thinks back to her pregnancy all those years earlier, and she recalls that she had gestational diabetes. She remembers that she had intensive management with diet changes, testing her sugars, insulin injections, and lots of diabetes appointments. She was told she was at high higher risk of type 2 diabetes later in life. But then after delivery, her diabetes test was normal. So she was reassured that it was gone and she didn't have to worry about it anymore. But she was advised to watch her diet and exercise, but no follow-up or support was really given for that. And she quickly forgot about that with the busyness of her life and her young children. Um, but she does recall that she did feel somewhat abandoned and she wasn't sure if she was still at risk and what to do about it. And sure enough, six years later, she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So um, diabetes affects over 1 million Canadian women. And even though the prevalence in women is lower than that of men, early research that I did with Dr. Jan Hux showed that it is young women under the age of 49 who experience the biggest increase in diabetes in Ontario, suggesting that women uh, were catching up to men. And so this really uh, underscored um, the, my research interest in looking at ways that we can target women and why are they having this bigger rise. And so that was also replicated in other um, um, places where uh, there was a bigger rise in diabetes seen among women in many low to middle income regions. So women are starting to experience an unequal burden of the diabetes epidemic. And this is just the one of the, a graph from the early study that I published with Dr. Uh, with Jan Hux in 2007, where we looked at the change in Ontario uh, uh, prevalence of diabetes between 1995 and 2005. And you can see here, this is old data now, but um, 
you can see that prevalence rose in all age groups and in both women and men, but the biggest rise was really seen in these young women between the ages of 20 to 34 and 35 to 49. And that was even after excluding gestational diabetes. And so um, that really launched my career, focusing on issues uniquely uh, impacting women uh, related to diabetes across the lifespan. And so um, first of all, how, does, how, how can diabetes impact women? So first of all, women with diabetes have higher risks of several um, uh, health conditions across their lifespan. First of all, young women with diabetes are more likely to have menstrual disturbances and infertility. Women with pre-gestational diabetes have higher increased pregnancy or increased pregnancy complications. And we know that um, diabetes is associated with, in women specifically, a higher risk of mood disorders, cardiovascular disease, vascular dementia, and certain cancers, um, particularly breast and endometrial cancer, higher risk for diabetes in women. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, women also have unique windows of opportunity in which we can identify and reduce risk if we catch uh, these uh, critical uh, periods, um, if we identify these critical periods in their life. So first of all, young women who develop polycystic ovarian syndrome um, are at higher risk of getting type 2 diabetes. Uh, uh, that's an opportunity to intervene and help them lower their risk. Gestational diabetes is another time where we've identified women at higher risk of diabetes, just like our case. And finally, um, at the time of menopause, women um, get uh, increase in insulin resistance resistance and weight gain, and some women will have metabolic syndrome that will emerge that will again mark them as having a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. So my research has really focused on these two windows of opportunity, gestational diabetes and issues for postmenopausal uh, women, particularly related to a higher risk of postmenopausal breast cancer associated uh, with diabetes. And so why did we look at association at the association between diabetes and breast cancer? So back when I started my uh, graduate studies, there was some preclinical physiologic uh, evidence to suggest that um, diabetes uh, and the metabolic um, uh, abnormalities of diabetes were associated with a higher risk of several types of cancers. And this is a schematic to sort of uh, show you some of the potential mechanisms. And it's largely thought to be due to shared risk factors. So first of of all, we know that type 2 diabetes is associated, and this is largely due to type 2 diabetes, by the way. So type 2 diabetes is associated with uh, higher rates of obesity and insulin resistance that often predate diabetes by five to 10 years. And um, we know that obesity is associated with a higher risk of cancer in, it, in itself. And specifically with related to breast cancer, we know that uh, in postmenopausal women, there's an increase in bioavailable estrogen, which is thought to be contribute to a higher risk of breast cancer for women with obesity. Um, but specific to diabetes, insulin resistance can also have an independent effect on cancer risk that has been shown to go beyond just the effects of obesity. And that's thought to be due to the compensatory hyperinsulinemia that occurs in response to insulin resistance, particularly early on with insulin, endogenous insulin being a growth factor um, that will promote the development of cancers and excess growth. And then finally, hyperglycemia can contribute to this, as well as some uh, pharmacotherapy, which I won't talk about today. And so um, when I started my graduate studies, I wanted to understand to what extent do these physiologic associations have relevance for our patients? How do they translate into epidemiologic associations? So I started by looking at whether there is an association on an epidemiologic level between diabetes and risk of breast cancer. And so I, I worked, I had the um, fortunate opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Jan Hux at ICS, where they, which houses the large healthcare administrative databases that allows us to look at these questions on a large population base level. And in particular, we had the validated Ontario Diabetes Database, as well as the Ontario Cancer Registry. So we could really look at these questions. And so sure enough, um, we I started as part of my thesis to look at the um, association between uh, postmenopausal breast cancer risk, as well as mortality and diabetes. And so we were able to show a small but significant association between di diabetes and breast postmenopausal menopausal breast cancer incidence that was both occurring after 
uh, diabetes diagnosis, as well as before diabetes diagnosis. If you recall, insulin resistance does predate diabetes. So we looked at both of those windows. And this, and then finally, we also showed that women with diabetes have a higher all-cause mortality after developing breast cancer compared to breast cancer patients who do not have diabetes. And so since then, these findings have been replicated in a whole host of epidemiologic studies around the world. And there's a consistent around 20% significant increase in breast cancer risk associated with diabetes. And it's uh, that's even after accounting for the impact of obesity and other risk factors. But then I went on to try to understand how diabetes might affect breast cancer prognosis. So in other words, that higher risk of all-cause mortality. And there are really two con potential contributors. One could be, does diabetes affect breast cancer specific prognosis or mortality? That could be due to cancer screening differences, stage more advanced stage of diagnosis, differences in treatment selection, more aggressive tumors. But also it's possible that um, the higher all-cause mortality with people with diabetes uh, who develop breast cancer is simply due to the diabetes and has nothing to do with their cancer. So in other words, non-cancer survivorship. But in addition to um, diabetes just being associated with higher mortality because of the diabetes itself, we also wanted to understand to what extent does having cancer worsen diabetes management and, in, and in further increase the risk of non-cancer mortality. And so um, through a series of studies, um, we, 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 we looked at this question first around diabetes, uh, breast cancer specific prognosis. And we showed that women with diabetes were more likely to present with a more advanced cancer stage. You can see that this is a very modest association, but because this was because it was after accounting for cancer screening. If we didn't account for cancer screening, um, there was a much uh, bigger association with more advanced stage. And I'll talk about screening in a moment. But I also wanted to point out that um, one of my wonderful students, who's now one of our faculty members, Dr. Ileana Lega, she led a study showing that indeed diabetes was associated with a higher uh, risk of breast cancer specific mortality, specifically in women who had more long standing diabetes greater than five years. And she also looked at the contribution of breast cancer treatments, chemotherapy, and surgery, and she did not find a difference. And so this this led us to say that likely this higher breast cancer specific mortality may be due to differences in detection and uh, breast cancer stage. Um, that's leading to more advanced disease at diagnosis. And so um, we indeed we looked at whether women with diabetes were getting the recommended uh, screening for breast cancer that would help to optimize their prognosis by catching the, the conditions earlier. And we know that uh, cancer screening is recommended for regular cancer screening is recommended for uh, um, postmenopausal women. Um, but in fact, just like we saw in our case, Diane, um, we saw a significant reduction um, in um, adequate breast cancer screening for women with diabetes in Ontario. And that we were one of the first to show this back in 2005, but this has since been replicated in a number of studies that, was, uh, that were summarized in a meta-analysis by one of my wonderful uh, graduate students who just defended uh, Dr. Uh, Dominika Batia, who did a systematic review meta-analysis and showed showed that um, diabetes associated with significant reduction in breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening. There was no difference in colorectal cancer screening overall, but when she substratified by sex, she found that women also with diabetes had a significant reduction in cancer screening. So it's clear that um, women with diabetes are missing out on the recommended cancer screenings uh, for, these, for these cancers, and that might be contributing to worse prognosis for those cancers when they get diagnosed. Um, and so, um, and, and that's been attributed, by the way, largely to the demands of diabetes care competing with this uh, primary preventative care. And so really 
uh, underscoring the need for us to have more co integrated, co coordinated care for people with multimorbidity. Um, and then the next phase of uh, studies we did was looking at whether there was an impact of cancer on diabetes management. Does having cancer make uh, diabetes, the quality of care for diabetes um, uh, go down and thereby that's contributing to their higher mortality? And this was actually a New York Times article. I was very proud of this back in 2012, where they profiled my work and that of others, really, you know, highlighting this um, this uh, idea of the fact that uh, people who have diabetes have to juggle those sort of uh, issues related to both diabetes and cancer. And so um, we, in fact, did show um, that, uh, that having cancer was associated with lower quality of diabetes care and more diabetes complications in cancer patients. So in this first study that was led by one of uh, a medical residents, Aaron Warndell, we were able to show that um, after a cancer diagnosis, um, patients with diabetes were significantly more likely to present with diabetic emergencies and have cardiovascular events in that first year. Another study conducted by Christy Liang, who's one of our incoming endocrine fellows starting uh, in uh, this coming next year, um, she used EMR data to show that cancer survivors with diabetes had significantly lower rates of being given the recommended therapies for cardiovascular risk reduction and less likely to meet their LDL targets. And so this, these two, this could also be contributing to higher cardiovascular events and higher all-cause mortality for patients with both diabetes and cancer. And so I've just given you a very brief overview of some of the work that I've done around post uh, diabetes and postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, and I've shown you that diabetes associated with a small but significant increased risk of breast cancer, as well as more advanced stage and higher mortality and lower cancer screening and poorer diabetes care may contribute. And this really underscores the need for more coordinated care for patients with diabetes and other comorbidities. Um, but I've also shown you that... Um, that the, the, these associations are due to a lot of shared risk factors. And so if so that really tells us that preventative strategies are really important, not just to reduce the risk of diabetes, but may have the capacity to reduce the risk of cancer if we target things like insulin resistance and obesity. And so we really need to identify those earlier windows of opportunity that I mentioned for prevention. And so that's really led me to start looking at, you know, how can we go back earlier and help women prevent getting uh, diabetes in the first place? And so gestational diabetes was one window that I really focused on in my research. And um, OK, just like just like we saw with our case. And so, as many of you know, uh, di uh, gestational diabetes is a temporary condition of pregnancy, affects about 10% of women, and is really seen as a stress test for the pancreatic beta cells that, that um, uh, identifies uh, women who are at high risk of progressing to type 2 diabetes. And, and uh, you know, the risk is estimated to be about sevenfold higher, but this risk rises early with 20 to 50% diagnosed in the first decade. And so this is a real key opportunity for diabetes prevention because of this, not only this stress test, but because um, these are women who are regularly accessing the healthcare system, they are captive, and many of them are motivated to make changes both for their uh, themselves and for their, uh, their offspring. And so we really need to capitalize on this opportunity. However, and, and actually, we also know that at least in older uh, individuals, that diabetes can be prevented with lifestyle interventions um, by with an estimated relative risk of about 47%. But what's currently happening after GDM pregnancy? As you heard from the case, um, women are often discharged back to their family doctor after delivery. They are advised to screen for diabetes and make behavior changes to reduce risk, but many actually don't see their family doctor or even get tested, and prevention follow-up is not routinely offered. And so we're really missing an opportunity for diabetes uh, uh, prevention in this population. And so that really led me to start looking at why are we missing this opportunity and what can we do to help change this? 
And so way back in 2009, I launched a longitudinal cohort study where we collected data on a cohort of women with gestational diabetes from four academic and two non-academic sites with the purpose of really trying to understand some of those barriers, facilitators, and preferences regarding diabetes uh, support and prevention after delivery. And so we did, we recruited over 1,300 women. We did medical chart reviews. We surveyed women at three time points in pregnancy, early postpartum, and late postpartum. Um, we did qualitative interviews. And now we're almost 10 years out. We've just completed administrative data linkage to be able to look at some of these early um, barriers and facilitators um, and how they impact ultimate risk of diabetes. And um, I'm not going to tell you all the data that we found from this uh, cohort, but I'm going to highlight a few key findings, particularly that were led by a number of my students that you see down here. So first of all, uh, Dr. Gita Mukherjee, one of our faculty members, when she was a student, she did a project looking at the survey data and to her surprise found that almost half of the women with GDM during pregnancy believed that they had a low risk of developing diabetes at 10 years. So we're not really even doing a good job of making women aware of this risk. Secondly, uh, uh, the vast majority of women are in a pre-action stage of readiness for change, and that does not change across the time periods. And so we really need to help women get into that action and contemplative stage so that they're actually um, able to do uh, make uh, changes. Um, the uh, GDM was seen as a, a wake-up call to modify behavior for many women, but they report that the competing demands of the maternal role, as well as many of those cultural norms that I identified with our case, um, are true barriers to, uh, to making those changes. And then we also showed that um, many ethnic minority groups have, any, have a higher burden of socioeconomic ba barriers. So there are those social determinants of health that make it even more difficult for ethnic minority groups who are at higher risk of both GDM and type 2 diabetes. And and in a lot of our studies, we've had over 70% non-Caucasian women represented in our Toronto population. And finally, a study led by my student Nabila Perno found that women who reported normal post -glucose, postpartum glucose tolerance after delivery, um, they experienced more weight retention one year later. And this suggested that they're getting this false reassurance that diabetes has gone away and that they don't really need to uh, make uh, health behavior changes. Um, and then I also want to make mention that one of the reasons why, you know, some of those, you know, uh, type 2 diabetes prevention strategies that were created for older people may not um, fit well for this population um, is due to some the impact of many sex and gender factors that impact the self-care in this population. So with regard to uh, um, sex-based factors, we know that... Um, uh, just having had a pregnancy and delivery and breastfeeding can lead to alterations in body image, limited sleep, and uh, more demands physiologically that can compete with self-care. But there's also those gendered um, issues that are starting to emerge, uh, specifically related to motherhood, around changes in self-efficacy, parental and family roles, adjustment to the new baby, and in particular, um, children and other family members needs taking priority over care seeking the need to be a good mother so we really need to recognize that and we really need to address that and it's recommended that if we're going to be effective at helping this population make health behavior changes we need to help women sort of integrate this um uh need to be a good mother with the need for self-care and because self-care currently comes last. And so one way that's recommended is that we say, well, you need to be a good role model for your family. So obviously we also want women to understand the importance of self-care, but the best way that's been shown to help uh, engage these women is to engage them at that level of how they can help their family. Um, and so, with all of this, um, we developed a, um, a, a program specifically customized and, and created for new mothers who had gestational diabetes, the Avoiding Diabetes After Pregnancy Trial in Moms, or ADAPT-M. 
And this program was uh, developed um, based on our, our survey data, based on interviews, based on as a review of the literature, but also based on a really unique program that we, we had become aware of at Women's College Hospital, which is a cardiac rehab program called the Cardio Women's Cardiovascular Health Initiative that was created specifically for women at high risk of cardiovascular disease and incorporated a lot of those um, uh, gendered issues. And so, um, and was, was a a virtual program that we thought might be feasible and 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 convenient for new mothers. And so, you know, we 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 use that as the basis of creating our program. And so this program uses a number of strategies that have been shown to be effective and were specifically designed for this population. One, women are provided with a health, a virtual health coach for six months. They're given customized diet and physical activity education that really uh, is customized to their needs, resources, barriers, and uh, levels of capacity, um, uses proven behavior change techniques, motivational interviewing, goal setting, with regular phone follow-up to help women advance goals and keep them accountable and on track. And um, so we then did three phases to try and test this program. The first phase was uh, Dr. Geeta Mukherjee's master's thesis, where she actually enrolled a number of women with GDM uh, postpartum in the Women's Cardiovascular Health Initiative, just a one-arm study, proof of concept, just to see uh, whether the program worked and what were some of those, you know, uh, implementation um, measures that we could look at. And to to our surprise and delight, um, we actually saw really high adherence and really high satisfaction with this program in this small cohort. And we were actually able to show significant improvements in fitness after three months that was maintained at six months. So we really thought we were on to something. So we took this program, we then modified it to be relevant for uh, women with GDM that incorporated diabetes related um, education. And we exported the program into community diabetes education centers where we train diabetes educators to be health coaches to deliver the program. And we initiated a randomized control trial with an initial pilot and feasibility phase. And we were able to show really good um, uh, retention for this population, 70%. I know it's not great for other RCTs, but for lifestyle modification for this population, 70% is good. Women had high satisfaction and, and acceptability of the program, and we found good feasibility for the healthcare providers. In fact, the program was really able to be properly, was really easily implemented within the context of clinical care and, and um, was low cost and, and a low resource. And so we then rolled in these women into an effectiveness trial funded by CIHR. We just completed the effectiveness trial. We randomized another 186 women. Again, pretty good retention. Um, and we're just still analyzing the data for effects on physiologic and anthropometric outcomes, as well as health behaviors and other outcomes. Um, but we have done some interviews, both with participants and with um, health coaches. And I'm just going to read you a couple of quotes that we've gotten from the, uh, from the participants. So this is one quote. Um, Overall, I think I had a healthier post-birth birth experience because of it, because of the program, because it's just a reminder, right, that you were part of this program. And when a baby is born, you just devote all your resources to the baby, and you kind of forget yourself for a while. And being part of this program, it was something like I could think a little bit about me and also think about, yeah, I need to be healthy. I need to try and be the best me for my baby. This is another one that speaks to um, the high number of um, ethnic minority and immigrant women that we, we, we see in our population. This was my first time, you know, being pregnant and experiencing gestational diabetes at the same time. And because my husband and I are immigrants and we have no support here in Canada, I knew that at the end of my pregnancy, I need support. <clears throat> Now, since we finished this trial, uh, 10 other studies have been published uh, that specifically created programs for 
um, that specifically created programs for uh, women with just postpartum women with gestational diabetes delivered in the first three years after their pregnancy. And while few of these programs were able to show significant uh, benefit on type 2 diabetes risk, when the data were combined with low heterogeneity, we actually see a significant 43% reduction in incidence of type 2 diabetes. So we now have evidence, and I'm hoping our study will also be congruent with this, that we can reduce type 2 diabetes even in this population with the right types of programs. Um, and so to summarize this part of my talk, um, uh, I hope I've shown you that GDM is a unique and important opportunity to identify and reduce diabetes risk, but currently postpartum follow-up and counseling is poor, and 20 to 50% of women progress to diabetes in 10 years. It's up to 50% for some ethnic minority groups. And we also know that type 2 diabetes can be prevented with programs, but they have to be tailored to maternal needs. Um, and frequent follow-up and personal accountability is key. Now, and the next step for us, for our program, is to take our program and to translate the evidence into practice, to to create a feasible, equitable, and sustainable implementation strategy. And we're currently applying for funding to do that. Um, now, this is a step in the right direction to try and um, provide uh, our patients with individualized support and behavior and skills for them to make behavior changes. But we also need to recognize that there are many factors that are beyond social and, demog and demographic and structural factors that are beyond the individual's control and even beyond the provider's control. So if we're really going to, as we saw with Diane, um, you know, there are there were many factors that really made it difficult for her to make changes. And so if we're truly going to meaningfully prevent diabetes, we need to address the upstream social and environmental factors that are often beyond an individual's control. And thankfully, at the University of Toronto, um, uh, with the uh, partnership between Novo Nordisk and the University of Toronto to, uh, to invest in this, uh, the problem of diabetes and chronic disease prevention, we can do just that. So um, I'm very honored to have been uh, appointed as the inaugural director of the University of Toronto Novo Nordisk Network for Healthy Populations. This po network was launched last year um, to support cross-disciplinary research to reduce the burden of diabetes and chronic disease. It is a partnership between the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, Dalalana School of Public Health, and the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. And uh, the goal is to partner with uh, academics across multiple disciplines with community stakeholders to create scalable solutions for chronic disease using Mississauga and the Peel region as a living laboratory. And our vision for the network is uh, to be an innovative and globally respected source of new knowledge on how to make populations healthier in an effective, feasible, sustainable, and equitable way. Um, our mission is to reduce the social inequities, really to look at those socially disadvantaged groups and reduce those inequities and risk and burden of disease, um, uh, risk and burden of diabetes and other chronic diseases through three goals, better care, lower risk factors, and healthier living environments. Um, Mississauga and Peel provides a unique opportunity for many reasons. They have a mix of suburban and urban neighborhoods, and many of their populations have a lot of those um, uh, social disadvantages that also disproportionately lead to higher risks of diabetes. So over 50% are born outside of Canada, 50% are low income earner, earners 52% members of visible minority, and they have higher rates of overweight and obesity and diabetes than the rest of the province. Um, how are we going to do this? So uh, through partnership between academics and stakeholders across three pillars, from um, the, uh, the, the, the micro um, setting, uh, where we're going to work with patients to improve diabetes care and the healthcare system, and with, with these stakeholders, at the meso level, where we're going to look at high risk groups um, and help reduce diabetes risk factors, working with community and other places where people spend their time. But then finally, we also need to target those upstream factors that are affecting all of us around policy and built environment um, to create healthier environments. Um, we're using the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion to help identify those different levels of interventions that have been recommended to help address 
uh, diabetes and chronic disease, from developing personal skills and reorienting health services, all the way up to building healthy public policy. So to make healthier choices easier for the whole population. Um, these are some of the activities that we're doing. Um, we're um, building capacity through research chairs, catalyst grants, and community partnerships. We're sparking and supporting new ideas and, and, and cross-disciplinary initiatives. Um, and we're um, engaging in education and knowledge sharing through uh, student support, fellowships, and education events. And this is just uh, pictures of some of the team that we've built over the last year. Uh, a shout out to our three executive uh, part uh, members, uh, executive committee members who represent the three partners, Dr. Jillian Hawker from uh, Medicine, uh, Alex Gillespie from UTM, and Rob Reed from Dalalana. Um, you can see some of the other faces here. Many are uh, from our Department of Medicine. But I also want to make a special mention of our inaugural chair. Uh, Dr. Beju Shaw, who is the Novo Nordisk Research Chair in Equitable Care of Diabetes and Related Conditions. Um, these are some ways that we you can get involved. Our website was supposed to be up last month. It's, I will let you know when it comes up. It's not up yet, but um, these are some of the ways in which people can get involved, and you'll see more once we get our website. And then finally, I wanted to just give a promotion for our event that we're hosting virtually next week, Monday, November 21st from 12 to 2 p.m. called Pitching Transformative Change for Diabetes, where our uh, Catalyst grantees will have an opportunity to pitch their ideas to a panel of judges, as well as um, a large audience of community stakeholders. And um, the presenters are here. And um, I will end there thanking all of the people that uh, have made this possible, uh, my collaborators, my students, my research team, as well as my funding support. And I will end there with uh, questions and maybe I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine, for just an amazing presentation. It's, um, it's a privilege to be taken on a, such a passionate, journey of your evolution of your research from when you were a student and right through to where you are now in this position that's going to have so much impact I really believe that and uh, I think Peggy Hill would be very proud of you as you take us through your journey you really um, you know it's clear how many people you've mentored mm -hmm. and and taught and how there's this foundation of, of uh, a lot of female clinicians and scientists and academics that that you're responsible for having inspired and mentored and, and trained. So very, very fitting for an FM Hill lecture. Um, and I think it's also, you've really shown us the importance of it, as if any of us needed to be shown the importance, but the importance of a clinician scientist where those questions that we raise in our clinical practice lead to the research, further questions, and then the research to look at the solutions and interventions. Um, so it really is quite the, the journey and, and demonstration of the importance of what we do in clinical research. So we've opened up to questions. If anybody would like to ask questions, please either raise your hand or put a question in the chat and um, we can take that question to Lorraine. One of the things, Lorraine, that really strikes me is that we have this, um, we have this model of care that is very sort of single specialist based care. And it seems to me that there's sort of like a hierarchy of chronic diseases where one chronic disease will take priority over another. Or if you get a chronic disease di diagnosed first, then that becomes the focus. So you're looking at diabetes and how that impacts cancer. I know the cancer researchers, including Carol Townsley in um, our ACT clinic, the Alpha Cancer Treatment Clinic, would tell you that it's it's also the same when someone's diagnosed with cancer, that they are less likely to be diagnosed with their diabetes. Um, I work in cardio rheumatology, and we know if you've got been already diagnosed with a rheumatic disorder, that you are not likely to know about your cardiovascular risk factors, including diabetes. It's undiagnosed. I don't know whether you've thought about. Um, I'm sure you have the models of care and and what that means for how we're delivering care, where you've got this this focus on one disease, and it depends on what's diagnosed first or what is perceived as the most important. I know Dr. Hawker would say that osteoarthritis is always put down at the bottom. <laughs> Of that hierarchy, even though it has major impact on quality of life and also 
risk factors like diabetes. No, I think, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, your kind words. Um, so to answer your question, I think we're all thinking very uh, deeply about, um, you know, the need to reorient health services and the need to think about how we can better integrate, um, you know, the care for our patient, putting the patient at the center, right? Right now, um, you know, it's very fragmented for people with multimorbidity and the different care teams often don't talk to one another. And so we need to find a way for, you know, the patient to, to, to be more at the center with with the care team talking to one another. There have been, um, you know, uh, sort of different, all sorts of different um, ways that people have looked at um, providing better support for, for example, patients who have diabetes undergoing chemotherapy, just speaking to what we found where they're, they're more likely to present an emergency with, with uh, dis, you know, um, disrupted glycemic control. So can we, for example, provide, um, you know, uh, diabetes support for, for the uh, chemotherapy teams, you know, so, we, you know, we have to, we have to use our our allied health more as well, um, you know, better navigation of the system for patients, um, providing centralized communication strategies, right? Like um, e-consults are a step in the right direction, but it still requires that sort of, you know, request for the consult. Do we, can we not have more of the team-based approach? I, I mean, I could talk about this forever, but I want to leave room for more questions, but absolutely, we really need to be think about thinking about integrating care. And just one last thing, even for the um, uh, GDM population, one of the main reasons why they don't get any diabetes follow-up is because the, the primary care physicians often don't know that they had GDM and, and uh, the patients don't think they have to go, don't have time to go see them. And really it's not the primary care physician anyway who's gonna be providing that diabetes prevention service, right? They don't have the time, the skills, uh, or the we don't have the, the capacity to to afford a pri you know primary care physician providing lifestyle modification and so what we're looking at is can we not just have a direct line to a um, diabetes education program in the community from the from the hospitals so that's an example of where we would just cut the primary care physician out I mean keeping them involved but but they don't need to have to navigate that for the patient mm -hmm. very oh, to cardiac rehab going straight from um, hospital admission to the exactly. had without any intervening step to try and improve. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Kathy Kelly. Hi, Lorraine. Sorry, I had to unmute there. I'm uh, down, I'm down south where it's thirty degrees, so don't feel oh, sorry. Well, thank you for joining, and I, <laughs> I don't feel sorry for you. Yes, no, no, and I, and I have to thank Jillian Hawker because I'm recovering from knee surgery, which I went ahead and did, as she said, "Don't wait till you're more disabled," you know. So thank her for that. Great, I'm glad you're yeah. recovering. <clears throat> so, um, Lorraine, I mean, I I have to. Oh my, this is you know, we go back way back when to your longitudinal clinic. And I, I have to sort of say it was difficult uh, to obtain funding for Lorraine for this longitudinal cohort of these gestational, these women with gestational diabetes who we knew there was a problem with and then picking them up eight years later when they all have diabetes. And, you know, that was a struggle. And I really need to commend Lorraine for this work and the ongoing follow-up of this uh, with so that we have data to use for other policy interventions. So congrats. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, yes, it was hard to get funding. We, but I, I benefited from AFP partly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think Kathy, that's been the case for many people working in women's health. Actually. Yes. Um, so I think we've got an amazing amount of momentum now. Yeah. Things have really yeah. taken off and we're starting to see um, the research actually being recognized and prioritized and funded. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, Mona Lutfi has her hand up and Mona is very much uh, a pioneer in, in women's health and, and research. Mona? Oh. Congratulations, Lorraine, an amazing talk, so interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm really interested in your work on the living environment um, in the Peel region. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, ethics approval and uh, consenting and community and like and and community involvement 
in that project um, uh, to do it in a good way and to see how you handled that. Thank you, Mona. Um, so we're we may we may consult you as we get more ahead. Right now, we're still early on. We haven't actually launched any research projects yet. What we're at the stage where we've created our advisory board, um, which has oh, there's an emergency alert, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll let people take a minute to look. Okay, it's only a test. Test. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, but obviously, yes, you have a lot of experience with community participatory research, and we will definitely look to you when we're starting those projects, because right now we're, we're, we're engaging people in their capacity as, um, you know, uh, uh, collaborators on the research, right? But obviously, when it comes to the point where we actually want to engage them as participants in the research, we're going to have to look at those issues. So thanks for that. Lorraine, there's a couple of questions in the chat. They sure. seem to have the same uh, theme of people are interested in why there is this reduced cancer screening in diabetic women. Um, question from Ma Chung and from Yuna Lee. Uh, is it because their time is spent on diabetes care or that they see assume seeing the endocrinologist like yourself is good enough for overall health and uh, all comprehensive? That's a great question, actually, and this is not unique to diabetes. It has it's it's similar across chronic comorbidities. And doc, I didn't show the data in the interest of time, but my uh, grad student did her PhD on this, where she looked at uh, uh, Dominika Batia looked at the um, impact of, um, of of a chronic disease. Um, on uh, adequate cancer screening, and not only did she show that. Mm, the majority of chronic diseases, including uh, mental health conditions, are associated with significantly lower cancer screening. But this, there was a stepwise decrease in cancer screening with increasing number of conditions. And so this really speaks to the, some of the work that's shown that has to do with the fact that um, care is very fragmented for people who have chronic comorbidities. Um, there's a lot of sort of you know diffusion of responsibility. Who's responsible for the the the, the primary sort of care housekeeping? things of take getting making your getting your flu shots getting your uh, cancer screening done usually it does fall on the primary care physicians but if if often patients are seeing all these specialists they may not actually see their primary care physician and so um, there are some programs that were built just to improve cancer screening overall like the Ontario best breast cancer screening program that has that we did later data we did a later study that showed that if women um were part of the Ontario Best Breast Cancer Screening Program with diabetes, that that uh, reduction in cancer screening was much smaller. So, you know, taking, again, it's back to taking the onus off the primary care physician, finding other ways to integrate all the pieces of people's care. So I hope that answers. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, Francis, you had a question? Yeah, I have a question relating to the first part of your talk, actually, and I was wondering whether you've been able to collect any blood samples on these patients to look for hormone levels and insulin-like growth factor and the like. Um, and there was a lot of interest in this in the Canadian Cancer Trials Group uh, a few years ago, and, and we really thought that IGF might be driving the cancers. Mm -hmm. And so trials were done, randomized placebo-controlled trials of metformin. And unfortunately, there was no difference in, in outcome. So that's maybe a little bit hard to explain and put together with the worse outcomes in diabetes. So, so do you, basically the question is, do you have blood samples? <laughs> we don't, unfortunately, oh okay. we don't. No, no, from that cohort, it was all, um, it was all sort of observational. We didn't actually uh, take blood from them, um, but I know I know of Pam Goodwin's. Pam, work. Yeah, Pam yeah. and uh, Vuk. Yes, she's done great work, and I'm, I'm I've been reading all the the papers that have come out um, looking at those metabolic um, markers of uh, of diabetes and insulin resistance and how they impact on on breast cancer. I know that some of her data has shown an uh, an association between insulin levels and uh, breast cancer. 
uh, prognosis. And so there, that was sort of, actually, I didn't mention this, but Pam was part of my thesis committee. And um, it was those data that one uh, partly led me to look at this on an epidemiologic level. Thanks. Well, Lorraine, it's one o'clock. Um, Arno's lowered his hand. He'll have to follow up with you with a question um, at another time. But I want to thank you again for thank a fabulous you. talk. A lot of people uh, in the chat are congratulating you on, on your talk and the amazing work you've done over your career. And we're very proud of you here at Women's College Hospital. You could see that with Kathy's um, comments. Um, and please, everybody remember to do the evaluation that I think uh, has been put in the chat and, chat and everybody's aware of. And um, I want to thank everybody for joining us here to help us celebrate uh, Peggy Hill, one of the pioneers uh, in women's academic medicine, and to celebrate Lorraine. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.